Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hello, everyone. I am Kona Gallagher. And I am Ethan Flick. And this is a special update bonus episode of And Then They Were Gone. We're dropping into your feed, not on our normal day. We just released a brand new episode, um, but we ha- could not wait. I'm jazzed up. I am jazzed up for justice because we got huge, huge news today. And this has to do with the case that we covered back in September of Akia Eggleston. She was the young pregnant woman in Baltimore who was reported missing in 2017 when she didn't show up for her own baby shower. The investigation into her disappearance left a little bit to be desired, um, but almost five years later, we have an arrest. I'm very curious to get into this. I I didn't get a chance to actually read the affidavit. Um, I read a a little bit of it before I had to leave work, so I really want to delve into it because the the first couple of pages that I read like was stuff that we already knew. Yeah, and the probable cause affidavit that he's talking about was released today by the Maryland State's Attorney's Office. Um, Marilyn Mosby uh, from Baltimore was the one who gave the pre- press conference today and talked about this. And it does. It's a seven-page document, and it does go through um, the timeline of events leading up to and after Akia's disappearance. Now, a lot of this, like you said, is stuff that we covered in our episode. So this is what we're going to do today. What we're going to do right now is talk a little bit about the arrest that was made and some of the new information that just came out today as a result of this. And then I'm going to put in our original episode after this. So this is going to be an extra long episode because it's our regular full Akia Eggleston episode that will be following this special update. So we're kind of doing a re-release on that. I'm excited. Yes. So let's talk about it because this is amazing. Just to give you a quick, quick overview of the case, uh, Akia Eggleston was eight months pregnant and had her baby shower scheduled for May 7th, 2017. She was last seen on May 3rd, 2017, where she made several trips uh, driven by a friend because she couldn't drive to ATMs and she withdrew several large amounts of money. Now, she had also been telling friends that she was going to move in with her baby's father. And so it seemed as though she was getting this money for like a security deposit or some other fee associated with that. But Akia was never seen after that day, and her baby's father was never a part of the search efforts or anything. We never heard a word from him. He wasn't even named. And in fact, his name has actually been misreported. So when you listen to our episode, you'll hear us refer to him as Andre Michael Robinson, because that's everything I read referred to him as that. His name, according to the charging documents, spoiler alert, is Michael Andre Robertson. Oh, okay. Yes. So anyway, um, he has been charged in Akia's murder and the murder of her unborn child. Right. But we also don't have a body yet. We do not. And we're going to get into that a little bit because this document actually does have a theory about that in it. So it's it's a pretty complete document. There's also a little bit uh, that we need to read between the lines. So let's go ahead and get into it. Akia lived with a female roommate in the Cherry Hill neighborhood of Baltimore. Most of her family lived in Maryland, but in different areas. So they were like an hour or so away. So, you know, they hadn't been to her house lately or anything like that. Akia also had an extremely high risk pregnancy. She was a very, very tiny, tiny lady and uh, was basically bedridden at this time. Right. And at this point, she's already eight months pregnant. Yes. 
and her C-section was scheduled, she was ready to go. On May 7th, when Akia didn't show up for her own baby shower and her baby's father, Michael, didn't show up because she had also told people that he was going to not only be there, but he was also bringing food. So neither one of them showed up and her family obviously got concerned. So they ended up going to her apartment. Not only did they not find Akia, but they saw that like all of her stuff was missing, including furniture, like a dresser, a crib that she had bought for the new baby, all sorts of stuff. But there was also no indication of forced entry or anything like foul play had happened in the apartment. Right. I think the only thing that that, that I read that was odd or slightly odd was that they found like gashes in the wall that were triangle yeah. shaped uh, that they were assuming was made by the edge of a dresser that had been moved. Exactly. Yeah. There are several triangle shaped holes in the wall that they did believe came from the dresser. I'm going to be reading a lot from this affidavit, but not all of it, because like you said, a lot of it is covered in our actual episode about this, but this is one of the key things. Quote, Supported by interviews, financial records, telephone records, and social media communications, law enforcement has reconstructed a detailed timeline of Eggleston's last days. Investigation revealed the only person with the motive, means, and opportunity to murder Eggleston was the purported father of her unborn child, Michael Robertson, end quote. And just real quick, um, because in our episode, we do question like why they knew each other because Robertson was actually friends with her stepfather. But it turns out, and this is in the charging document, that they met when his grandmother babysat her as a young child in the 90s. And then they reconnected in mid-2016 after a mutual friend's birthday party. So Robertson at the time was 35. And Akia would have been about 21. Okay. And he was already in a relationship with a woman who up to this point has not been publicly named, but her name is in this document. And so I feel comfortable saying that it's Hallie Pomeroy. They also said her name at the press conference today. And she had kids with him. Exactly. She was 22 and uh, she had two children with him. She gave birth to her second child with Michael Robertson in August of 2016, which is right around the time that Akia got pregnant with her child. Just to keep the timeline straight, the last day Akia was seen where she made all of those withdrawals was May 3rd, 2017. On May 1st, she messaged a friend on Facebook and said, quote, Gotta put a deposit down on the new place, renew my permit, and see what's going on with this car if I decide to get it, end quote. And then the friend was like, what place is this? And she said, quote, it's a place on Mount Street, going to see it tomorrow, see if I like it. If so, I'm giving a deposit, end quote. Then the next day, on May 2nd, Robertson sent Akia photos of this apartment via Facebook Messenger, but the pictures were really like blurry and weird. And he's like, oh yeah, these pictures suck. Like I'll send, I'll text you better ones. So on May 2nd, she went and got a money order and, you know, all of this other stuff. And then at 1.41 p.m., she sent a Facebook message to Michael saying, quote, I called you, I got the money order, end quote. That same day, she also talked to another friend and, you know, just talking about normal stuff. She said that everything was going all right, but she was not entirely sure about Michael because, you know, he was in a whole other relationship with somebody, with children, you know, so she wasn't exactly sure how this was going to end up. But she was still playing it out. She was. And, you know, she was looking forward to the future. Like she was planning a future with this man. Right. In her mind, he was going to pay for a house for them to live in and he was going to buy them a car. So like she thought all of this was happening in the very near future. But while she's having this conversation with a friend, Robertson was Googling, quote, where can I cash a money order in Baltimore, Maryland? Later that afternoon, she was withdrawing more cash from an ATM. And during this she was texting back and forth with Michael. But we don't know what those texts said because uh, Akia's phone has never been found. Based on cell phone records, he was at work during the day on May 2nd, 
it seems, though, again, from this data that he left work at the normal time, but that he arrived at the cell site area near Akia's home by 4.15 on May 2nd. Akia's phone showed that she returned to that same cell tower area about an hour later at 5.17. At 6.05 p.m., she posted a photo of her pregnant belly on Facebook. One minute later, Robertson and his other girlfriend, Haley Pomeroy, began a series of text messages and Facebook messages back and forth that continued into the early morning hours of May 3rd. Hmm. Yeah. At 10.42 p.m. on May 2nd, he sent Hallie Facebook messages that he was sleeping and he just laid down and, quote, don't do this. Then he texted things like, please, Hallie, I'm going crazy. Please call me. I'm walking over there. At 11.58 p.m., he wrote, almost at I-95, even though his cell site data showed that he never left the cell tower coverage near Akia's house. So he apparently spent the night at Akia's home on May 2nd and was fighting with Hallie the entire night by a text. Right, and didn't didn't I see somewhere that they were their residents were 10 miles apart because Haley was living with uh, her either parents or grandparents. Yeah. Her mother in in Elkridge. Elkridge. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're 10 miles apart. So there's no way that this guy's walking 10 miles. No. At all. So it seems to me as though he was posting that giving himself an online alibi. Yeah, he might've been, but according to, Again, cell phone data and his employment records, he was at work in Washington, D.C. at a job site by 6.30 a.m. on May 3rd. What's very key and very telling in this document is that they refer to May 3rd as the day of Eggleston's murder. They have a very clear theory as to what happened. Okay, I'm curious as to how they narrowed it down to that day. Yeah, so he and uh, Akia texted throughout the day, and then he also called Hallie at about 7.52 in the morning, and they spoke for 11 minutes. So he was juggling them both that morning. While he was at work. Yeah. Now, on the afternoon of May 3rd, Akia is seen on Bing surveillance video, and this is the surveillance video that we talk about extensively in the episode. So this is the BB&T footage, and it's at 12.52 p.m. She's seen depositing two money orders as well as a paycheck. The total of that deposit was $572.42. She also made a $450 cash withdrawal. Also during that afternoon, she had several Facebook messages with friends where she was talking about this move to the apartment on Mount Street. So this is something that she was telling many people she and Michael were planning to do. During these conversations, uh, the subject of her baby shower also came up because it was four days away. And one of her friends was like, oh, so, you know, he, like Michael, is actually going to be at the shower. She's like, yeah, he is. So again, she was planning a future. Now this, I don't know why, because there are so many details about this that came out today that are incredibly disgusting, but this one has stuck with me all day. On May 3rd, at approximately 3.45 p.m., a Lyft driver picked up an individual later identified as Michael Robertson. Now, they picked him up off of I-97 in Ferndale, Maryland. The ride was requested from Akia's account. So either she got him the lift and paid for him to come kill her, or he used her account to get the ride to come kill her. So he was picked up in Glen Burnie about 10 miles away from Akia's home. And then at about 4 p.m., the Lyft driver dropped Michael off one building over from Akia's apartment. Call detail records and cell site information indicates that Eggleston's phone was at or near her residence between 3.05 p.m. and 4.05 p.m. on May 3rd. So so that, to me, says that, says that she ordered him a lift. Probably, yes. Because if she's at the residence, Glen Burnie is not, that's 10 miles away. So it's not like 
he had her cell phone and was using it in Glen Burnie to go back to the residence. So right after this ride was booked, Lyft called Akia and then Akia called Michael. So it does seem like she did order it for him. Like Lyft called her to make sure it was cool. She called him to say the Lyft is on the way, basically. Gotcha. And that's the last contact between Akia and Michael's phones on May 3rd. The next voice call on his phone was at 5.34 p.m., at which time his phone was near her house. Based on all of this, police believe that they were together at Akia's apartment late in the afternoon of May 3rd. At around 5.22 p.m., um, Akia sent a friend the invitation to her baby shower. And that was the last outgoing message from Akia to anyone. 5.22, you said. Mm-hmm. Phone calls made and received from Michael's phone between 5.35 to 6.18 p.m., all pinged near her house. Michael and Hallie called each other four times between 5.35 and 5.40. And then they didn't speak again until 6.05. And they get a little bit more into detail in terms of like gaps and times. But the basic thing, you know, is like those were the last calls. And then Hallie and Michael were talking. At 6.22 p.m., his phone begins to move away. And he continues to talk to Hallie. And do we know where Hallie's cell phone was at the time? That's not in this document. Though I would imagine it's in a document. I think the answer to that is yes. Yeah. At 6.51 p.m., Michael's phone was located in the area of East Lombard Street and South Howard Street in downtown Baltimore. The last activity on Akia's phone at all was an incoming call from a telemarketer at 6.57 p.m., and then nothing ever came through after that, indicating that the phone was turned off or dead or something. Right. Shortly after 7.00, Robertson went to his brother's house on Wilkins Avenue. This brother was interviewed most recently on November 9th of 2021 and said that it was like a little bit of a weird visit. Like usually Michael came over to his house to eat, uh, like basically just eat all his food, but like didn't want anything to eat. He brought a 40 with him, which he like usually never had money to do. They played a couple of video games on the Xbox and then Michael left. The brother says he did not see a Kia during this time. Nothing like that. There's no location data for Michael's phone after that. It seems like he turned it off because the next thing is the next morning at 8.17 a.m. where he's back at work in Washington, D.C. So what's the, what's that time gap Be- between at his brother's house that we know of? So he got to his brother's house uh, shortly after 7 p.m. and then had his phone off until the next morning. That's a long he, time. It is a long time. And so six, but he was with Akia, you know, probably around like 530. Right. So that's not a lot of time in between her sending out Facebook invitations and him being alone at his brother's house. It is a long time between when he left his brother's house and when he went to work the next morning and his phone was turned back on. Right, but the the timeline has no further information beyond when she sent out that the baby shower evite, right? No, that, the only other information that we had was there was an incoming call to her phone at six fifty seven. So her phone was still on. Right. Six fifty seven. But the, the she sent out that that, that invite, invite at around five thirty. Five thirty. Yeah. So that's the last known contact that she had with anybody. So fast forward to the 7th, the baby shower happens, they don't show up, they call Akia's phone, it goes straight to voicemail because again, it's been off since the 4th. And we again, we get more into that in the episode, so you can listen to that. They also start calling Michael's brother to see if they can find Michael because he didn't show up either, but his brother has no idea where he is. The first time Michael was interviewed was May 9th, where he told police that he last saw Akia on May 1st or May 2nd. And then they're like, okay, well, and they didn't know. I mean, they're like, all right, they took it at face value. They didn't have phone records at that time. So they're like, okay, he saw May 1st, May 2nd, whatever. Then they wanted to re-interview him. Couldn't find him. 
They couldn't find him until June 15th, over a month later. So they found him, they interviewed him again, and then they couldn't find him again. And they weren't able to locate him for another interview until October of 2017. He was last interviewed on October 19th, 2017. And within days, he and Hallie moved to Michigan, where Hallie's family lives. Robertson's story to the police was basically that he and Akia had broken up. And that's why he didn't know what was happening or, or anything. In his June interview, he said, quote, I was there Monday and when I left and went to work and when I came back, my shit was packed for me. So I took that as the hint. Okay, well, I'll get my shit and roll. I tried and call and talk to her. Now her room was still rented and everything. She didn't answer me. She ain't talked back to me. And that was the last that when I left that Monday, I came, went upstairs, I knocked on her door and I said I was about to leave there. And she said, all right. And she closed her door and laid back down and went back to sleep. And that was the last time I saw her, end quote. I'm going to read this next part too um, from the affidavit. It says, quote, Robertson was asked if Eggleston knew he was coming over later that afternoon, despite the fact that he told investigators he was with Eggleston that morning and the several phone calls and text messages between them during the day, just an aside, because this is June, so they already have the phone records by this point. He said, quote, I talked to her the night before and I let her know. I said, hey, I'm, you know, end quote. Robertson also claimed he called and texted Eggleston when he arrived at her apartment that afternoon and received no response. He stated, quote, her phone was ringing. It was on and everything. It was ringing and I texted. She didn't respond. So I texted her back and I was like, well, okay, I can take a hint. And so I gathered my stuff and I left, end quote. And again, none of this matches up with the cell phone data because he's saying all this was like the first or the second, but they have the last phone call between them being on May 3rd at 3.44 p.m. Plus, there's the whole lift pickup thing. Right. So during this June interview, um, police asked him for his phone number at the time he last saw Eggleston. And he gave them the phone number, but it wasn't right. He just gave them the wrong number. And they also asked him about this apartment. He's like, what, what apartment? What Mount Street? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> So then I said he was interviewed on October 19th, 2017. And then this time they confronted him with all the stuff about the apartment, all the Facebook messages, the pictures, everything. And he was like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I did send those. But we didn't go look at it. It didn't go anywhere. She couldn't leave the house. She was on bed rest. How would we have gone and looked at an apartment? By this time, investigators were able to get his internet search history and all of that. So they got into his Google account and they did a reverse image search on the photos that he had sent to Kia and they were for a totally different apartment. They weren't for an apartment on Mount Street. It was a totally different apartment that was like $3,000 a month, which is not at all what they had been talking about. Right. Back in this October interview, they asked him again about his phone because they're like, hey, remember when we asked you for your phone number and you gave it to us and it was wrong? And he's like, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually changed my number because I was getting death threats. He said that Akia's relatives had been calling him and accusing him of being responsible for her disappearance. So he was like, yeah, I had to change my number because her family was just coming after me. But... Again, the phone record showed that he changed his phone number on May 6th, a day before anybody even knew Akia was missing. I mean, this guy's backing himself into a corner, and, and th- this is, <laughs> it's, it's a good line of questioning by the detectives. It is. It absolutely is. I mean, yeah, they're just giving him the rope and yeah. he's hanging himself. Yeah, exactly. Because they already have the evidence. They do. And so speaking of a little bit more evidence, the Google account that I mentioned, they reviewed his search history from October 14th, 2017. And it revealed, quote, 18 distinct searches or links clicked regarding trash pickup, landfills, or dumpster pickup in Baltimore City. Specifically, searches were conducted on that day for, quote, where does Baltimore City trash go and picked up? Search twice. Quote, Baltimore City dumpster pickup and, quote, Baltimore City landfill. 
The searches were conducted a few days after Fox 45 News aired a report on Eggleston's disappearance, end quote. So basically where Akia lived, her apartment, it was an end unit and it abutted a parking lot that had large dumpsters. Police kind of knew this um, early on and they did search the landfill in Northern Virginia that those dumpsters end up in. But they were searching in like two 10 acre sections. There was over 500,000 tons of waste compacted in those sections, which are filled up to 40 feet deep within a few weeks of her disappearance. Right. Safety regulations only allowed them to dig four feet deep. Right. So they didn't find anything. Yeah. And they can't exactly release cadaver dogs out there. Exactly. I mean, there's way too many smells. And it's too deep. It's yeah. just too deep. There's just too much. Let's get back to Hallie. Yes, let's. As your dad would say, she's up to her ass in this. <laughs> Is that, is that something that he says a lot and I just don't notice? Oh, yeah. He says it all the time. Like, usually when he's talking about his state parole days. Uh, okay. She told police in an interview on October 4th, 2021, that she and Michael had stayed in a hotel together in Maryland the weekend of the baby shower. She also confirmed getting into a volatile argument with him the night of May 2nd about Akia's sonogram photo that she posted on Facebook. So I think she posted a belly photo and a sonogram photo, mm. and that obviously caused a huge fight, which we talked about based on the phone records, where he was just kind of talking, texting with her all night. Right. She was very angry about this baby. Rightfully so. She was well aware of Akia and Michael. I don't know if she knew about this whole plan that, she, that he was feeding Akia about moving in together. But there was definitely anger there. There was definitely tension there. There were definitely fights at that point, right before Akia's disappearance. So we don't know what she knows. She has not been charged at this point with anything. But... She said that she was in a hotel in Maryland with him that weekend. She also moved to Michigan with him. And also, after they moved to Michigan, he apparently didn't want to get a job or have any paperwork associating his name with their location at all. I wonder why. So weird, right? So at this point, and... We're going to link to the press conference that Marilyn Mosby gave today um, on the blog so you can watch the whole thing. It's very interesting. Akia's family spoke, as well as a representative from the Black and Missing Foundation, which has really helped get Akia's case back in the spotlight. So I want to talk about a few things, and this is getting really long, and you know, we're, we've got the whole original episode after this, but there are a few things that struck me about this. Akia went missing nearly five years ago. It'll be five years in May. This is February 3rd when we're recording, when this arrest happened. Right. All of this evidence... Was evidence back then? Yeah. Yes. It was found extremely early on. Maybe not all of it, because again, the, the interview with Hallie, it said, was done on October, in October 2021, and there's no mention of any other interviews with her, at least not in this document. There could have been. I have a theory about that, but... No, please. Tell me. The reason why the interview with Haley didn't come until later mm -hmm. is because they were trying to get more information on him. But I also think that they're now charging him as the sole perpetrator of this and dangling him out, seeing if he'll give her up too. Because I think she was an accomplice in this. The cell phone records indicate immediately after 530 when he's supposedly walking away and he's he's calling her and then he ends up at his brother's house and then his phone goes dark. And then that's that weekend, several days later, they're supposedly in a hotel room together. She knows more than she's saying. I'll say that. So I actually kind of think it's the opposite. I don't think that they're trying to see if he'll give her up. I think that they're trying to cut a deal and they're going to try to see if he'll give them more information about where Akia is in exchange for her not being charged or her being charged with a lesser offense. Sure. I can see that too. 
That's my personal theory on this. Marilyn Mosby was very careful to say that they believe that they have arrested the person responsible for Akia's death. She was also careful to say that she couldn't talk about anything outside of these charging documents. So what's going to happen with Hallie Pomeroy is, in my mind, still up in the air. Uh We don't know yet. But I do think it has to do with what Michael is going to be saying once he's extradited back to Maryland. So he was arrested at his home in Michigan uh, by the FBI and the U.S. Marshals. And he is currently going to be extradited back to Maryland, though they weren't sure about the timeline on that. Sure, but let's also circle back. Yeah, let's circle back to the timeline of this investigation. Yeah. Because most of this information was gathered in the first two months of twenty of, of Akia being missing in 2017. They had this, but Michael kept on hiding. He kept on evading questioning, and they didn't push it. So I really appreciated the fact that the representative from the Black and Missing Foundation was at the press conference today because they are a huge reason why any of this happened. Because if it weren't for them, if it weren't for other organizations like them, if it weren't for people who refused to let this story die, Michael and Hallie would have just still been in Michigan living their lives because this case was dead. Akia's family said that they couldn't get calls back from detectives. It was dead. But the Black and Mystic Foundation kept going. Other people kept going. And again, it's crazy how every episode we've done since September is going to mention Gabby Petito. But Gabby Petito's case helped push this one back into the forefront. Because right after Gabby Petito's case, when there was the whole backlash about missing white woman syndrome and all of that, People Magazine ran a cover story about missing people who had not gotten the same attention that Gabby had, and Akia was one of those people. And so there was that Black and Missing had the documentary on HBO, which Mm -hmm. also featured Akia. Right. So right around the time that all of this is happening in the media in September, October, in that time frame, that's when they're going to Michigan. That's when they're doing these interviews. That's when they're pulling all of the pieces of this puzzle together. And that is when they are finally building the case and actually moving forward with this. Yeah. And I, I, (laughs) I mean, I hate this. I ha- I hate that it comes down to this, but we need more pressure on our elected public officials in this area. That's the only way it's going to get done. I mean, I, I hate that it, you can't just say the cops should do their job because clearly they're not. They ha- Like you said, they had this information before and they just didn't move on it. Now, I understand that... The, the, the information that they have is relatively circumstantial, but there hasn't been anything new. So why are they moving on it now? Yeah, exactly. Because they're getting pressure from the mayor's office to move on it. Yeah, nothing has changed. This case is built mainly on cell phone data, IKEA's text messages and social media messages, Michael Robertson's text messages and social media messages, and his interviews with police And the fact that his interviews and the statements he made in them contradict all of everything that I mentioned before. All of this, or at least 95% of it, they had in 2017. Right. So they're moving on it now because of public pressure. Yeah. So that's why we need to keep going. We need to keep putting the pressure on. We need to keep telling these stories. And this was not planned at all. Because, but our episode next week, the one that will be released on on February 9th, is very similar to this case. And I wrote it. We haven't recorded it yet, but I've already written it. And I even mention Akia in that episode because it is so similar. So we need to keep going. I'm going to bring you another case next week of a very similar circumstance, something that can easily be solved if we put the public pressure on the investigators. 
So I hope you will join us next week when we talk about that case. And I hope that you keep on joining us because this podcast, for those of you who have not listened to us before, covers solely unsolved missing persons cases. These are people who have loved ones, who have friends, who have people who are looking for them, people who love them, people who miss them. They come from all walks of life. They are different races. They are different genders. They come from different circumstances, different socioeconomic backgrounds, but they all deserve to be found. And we want to tell their stories. So please join us again when we tell you about our next cases and the next people that we need to get justice for. So thank you for joining us today for this special bonus episode. I know it's a little longer than uh, I had planned it to be. But, you know, like I said, I am jazzed up on this one. I am so excited that we have gotten somewhere. So if you have not listened to our full episode on Akia's case, you can get all of the information right after this, and we will play the original episode that aired back in September of 2021. So, you know, we were talking about this before the police went and interviewed them in Michigan, but whatever, it's fine. So thank you very much for joining us. and. We will see you here again next week on Wednesday for a brand new episode. See you next week. A 22-year-old woman is eight months pregnant and is supposed to be on bed rest. Instead, she called a friend and asked her to drive her around to run some errands. On May 3rd, 2017, Akia Eggleston went to several banks and ATMs and withdrew large sums of money. Then, all activity on her social media stopped. But it wouldn't be until four days later when Akia failed to show up to her own baby shower that her family would realize she was missing. Now, four years later, Akia and her baby are still missing, and Baltimore police don't have any answers. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Akia Eggleston. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Um, before we get started, first, you know, we have a couple new uh, members on Patreon, so we want to give them a shout out. Kay and Addison B., uh, thank you so much for your support. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And uh, again, if you'd like to support the show, you can do so over on patreon.com slash pod. I'd also like to take a second to talk about the last episode we released, which is a bonus episode on Gabby Petito. Uh, Gabby was on a cross-country hiking trip with her fiancé, and she went missing. We're recording this on September 20th. On September 19th, authorities uh, did say that they had found a body uh, that had matched Gabby's description. So they did, you know, tell her family, they obviously made the announcement, um, you know, the forensic analysis isn't complete, but they're, they're, you know, pretty sure it's her. So obviously that's an incredibly sad ending to this story. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's the ending that I think most of us kind of assumed what was going to yeah. happen, but we all hoped yeah. for a different outcome. Yeah. And as of right now, Brian Laundrie uh, is in the wind. 
Um, so, you know, it's still important to keep this, you know, on the top of your mind and, and, and find where he is and hopefully, you know, bring him to authorities safely. Yeah. Because he's the one that has the answers. He does. He does. So as much, as much as everybody wants some sort of justice for Gabby or vigilante justice for Gabby, it's more important to get him in to custody so that he can answer for what happened. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, anybody who is in the area of, well, Brian uh, went missing in Florida Mm -hmm. um, from Northport police department is the one that's handling his case there. They're doing searches. He really, he could be anywhere because he's been missing almost a week. It'll be a week tomorrow. Right. I also wanted to talk about something that's very real that we have touched on, you know, on the show in the past that actually dovetails into this week's case, which is missing white woman syndrome. And a lot of people have been talking about that, you know, with Gabby, because there are a lot of folks that they're like, I don't understand why this is, you know, getting so much attention. And yes, missing white woman syndrome is real. Like, when you're pretty and you're white, you get more media attention. Like that's been proven over and over again. In this particular case, I think it's also that uh, there, the circumstances surrounding it were yeah. so odd. I was you just going to say, it's the, it's the unique circumstances of the fact that he just like showed up yeah. at his parents' house without her. And then no, nobody reported her missing for what 11 days yeah. after that. So I, I think it's it's that definitely plays into it, the missing white woman syndrome. However, I think it's the bizarre circumstances of the case, especially when police went to question him and he immediately had a lawyer. Right, right. I mean, I think that's more what it was captivating about this. Yeah, and it's also important to yes, realize that not everybody gets equal amounts of coverage and that's not okay, but that doesn't mean that she didn't deserve coverage, you know, because she was still somebody who was missing and she had fam- a family who was going out of their mind wondering where she was. So, you know, I it, it's important to cover every case. And what the reason why I said that that dovetails into this week's episode is because this is the case of a woman who went missing under very weird circumstances and she was eight months pregnant and it didn't get a lot of media attention. And a lot of people think that that's because Akia was a black woman living in Baltimore, you know? So I, I, I really wanted to cover this case and I actually started uh, writing this before um Gabby's story, you know, was happening. Um, and it was actually inspired by another podcast that I've just started listening to. It's called Black Girl Gone. It's a great podcast. Like I said, I just started listening to it, but she covers uh, missing and murdered black women pr- uh, primarily. So she really does cover a lot of cases that aren't covered very widely. And I do think she also has an Akia Eggleston episode. So yeah, anyway, so that's kind of what inspired this. So let's tell her story. Yeah, let's get into it. Akia Shanta Eggleston was born on September 6th, 1994. She grew up in Maryland and dreamed of being a model and a dancer. Akia was a tiny girl. Now, It's so weird because, like, I read, obviously, a ton of things about her, and reports vary on her actual height, but they vary between 4 foot 8 and 4 foot 11. Oh, wow. Yeah, Uh, so, like, teeny tiny. Yeah, and she's, you know, about 100 pounds or so. So, like, just a, yeah, a tiny person. So, like, Simone Biles size. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, you know, so I don't know a whole lot about her family life, just that she does have siblings. Um, Her mother remarried when she was five to a man named Sean Wilkinson, and Sean raised Akia from that point. Like, he, you know, is her stepfather, but he's her dad. In 2012, when Akia was just 17 years old, her mother passed away from breast cancer. 
Oh, no. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, at the end of high school, it was obviously a devastating blow for her, but she buckled down and she finished high school. You know, she graduated and her dad, Sean, like talked about that, like how it just, she was at such a transitional period in her life already, you know, with getting ready to finish high school and then to have this happen was incredibly, incredibly difficult. But she, you know, she persevered and she got through as best as she could. After high school, she worked in retail. I couldn't get like a whole lot of details um, about, you know, what Akia did. But when she was about 20, she actually gave birth to her first daughter, Emery. Now, she, love that name. I know. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I like that, too. She and Emery's father didn't stay together, but they were both, you know, involved in their in her life. They were co-parenting. Akia ended up moving to the Cherry Hill neighborhood of Baltimore, but, you know, remained close with her stepfather, who was in Gaithersburg, Maryland, as well as her aunt and her grandmother, who also lived nearby. You know Maryland better than I do. How far is Gaithersburg from Baltimore? Probably like an hour, maybe. maybe okay, that's what I was kind of thinking. Maybe I more. wasn't sure. Yeah, it's it's pretty far away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So and so, I think that makes sense. So she's they're close enough that like they're still able to function as a support system for her, but not necessarily somebody that you'd see every day. Yeah, I was just gonna say not not necessarily a support system on a on a daily basis. Right. Right. And I do believe she also had siblings still in the area. So, like, her family still lived in Maryland. Like, they were around. But, again, her moving to that Cherry Hill neighborhood, it sounds like did put, you know, a bit more physical distance between all of them. And I, I know you, you brought up uh, the stepfather, but where what happened with her biological father? Do we know anything about him? No. He's never come up in this, so I don't know if he was part of her life at all, but she considered Sean to be her dad, basically. Okay. Though Akia had people she could turn to, she also kept a lot of her life private. In late 2016, she became pregnant with her second child, but she didn't tell anyone in her family who the father was. Akia's grandfather, Eric Wilson, told Crime Watch Daily, quote, she never discussed with us who the baby's father was. I didn't ask, end quote. While she was close with her family, like she was living her own life, you know, as a 22-year-old mother. She had this townhome in Baltimore that she shared with the roommate, and the roommate also had a small child. So when Akia would have Emery over, like there was this other little kid there to play with. So it, you know, it seems like a pretty good setup. Yeah, sounds ideal. Yeah. And I don't know the exact custody details, like who had Emery, what percentage of the time, uh, but it sounds like it sounds like they split custody. Um, and I do know that like Akia's family would help watch Emery too sometimes. So it just seems like they kind of made it work, however they needed to make it work, you know. Mm -hmm. As Akia's due date grew nearer, her health problems grew. Her baby was breached and like honestly half her size already. I mean, she like pictures of her shortly before she went missing, like her, her belly is like her entire body. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. Cause when you're that small. Yeah. Like that baby did not have anywhere to go. So <laughs> the baby was breached and she and her doctor had already scheduled a C-section for the end of May. Akia's doctor had also put her on bed rest, but according to her family, she wasn't very good at listening and staying off of her feet. Maybe it's because she was like 4'8 or whatever, but Akia was a spitfire and just like full of energy and couldn't stay still. She was also very social and took it upon herself to play in her own baby shower. <laughs> <laughs> like she knew what she wanted. And so she was like, I'm just going to get this done. <laughs> go for it you know like, yeah like she had relatives and friends you know helping out um like setting up and you know stuff like that but she's the one who took the initiative and booked the venue and even put down a 900 hundred dollar deposit wow yeah the baby shower is also going to be a gender reveal so oh. she was like she was she going, was going all out oh yeah absolutely 
Akia had been in regular contact with her friends and family who were helping her put on this baby shower, and she was a big social media user. Her Facebook page is still up, and a lot of her posts are public, and she was usually posting daily and sometimes multiple times a day. And I can only imagine that as she became more pregnant and like just simply walking became difficult for her, that she probably spent a lot of time scrolling through social media. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, yeah. I mean, if she was ordered on bed rest, like she's probably bored out of her skull. Yeah. And her know? friend was saying like she really was like she could barely walk like at that point. Because she was ostensibly on bed rest, I don't believe she was working at this time, you know, toward the end of her pregnancy. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure where her income was coming from, though. I've read that she had worked in retail, like I mentioned, but I don't know, like, when she had to stop doing that because of the pregnancy. I also read that she may have gotten some money when her mother passed away, but it sounds like that may have been more like life insurance than an inheritance, so... I don't know that she still had any money from that or if that all just went to, you know, funeral expenses and things like that. Right. But I bring this up because money comes into play in this story. As I mentioned before, Akia put down a $900 deposit on the venue for her baby shower. And that's not an insignificant amount of money, especially to a 22-year-old single mother. I mean, look, I wouldn't want to spend $900 on a baby shower and, you know, we're in totally different circumstances. Well, no, and also, keep this is a deposit, so, you know, presumably she would be getting that back, I guess, or at least part of it. I don't really know how it worked, but, like, I was a 30-year-old single mother, and I would have been hard-pressed to come up with $900, just in general. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, I, I wouldn't spend $900 on a on a on a baby shower. Well, regardless of what it's for, I would have just had a hard time getting $900 period. <laughs> but you know, like maybe Ikea was just better with money than I was. Like, I, I don't know. Well, you and I are both terrible with money. So yeah. it's, that's not outside of the realm of possibilities. <laughs> so Ikea's baby shower was going to be on May 7th. On May 3rd, her grandmother tried calling her a bunch of times, but she didn't answer. So she texted her and was like, is your phone dead? Uh, And Akia texted back and said that, no, it wasn't dead, but she couldn't talk. Now, Akia's grandmother, looking back, doesn't think that that was her. She thinks that somebody had her granddaughter's phone. Okay, so when when was that? You said May May 3rd. May 3rd. Yeah, four days before the baby shower. And when did her friend take her? May 3rd. And that was the last time anybody actually saw her? Yes. Okay. Okay. So it's May 7th, the day of the baby shower. Akia's friend, Cece Diaz, was one of the people who had helped set up for the party. So Akia's family is there, her friends are there, the food is there, like the decorations are up, but there's no Akia. So everyone waits around and then they start calling and texting, of course, but the calls go straight to voicemail. Although this does seem alarming, no one is insanely worried at this point because like they're concerned but they think that the most likely scenario is that she went into labor and doesn't have her phone with her yeah i mean that makes sense well exactly because she was like real pregnant you know Mm -hmm. and this was a high risk pregnancy so that especially makes sense if we're talking like an emergency c-section or something like that she's not going to have her phone in the or (laughs) So they started calling around to hospitals because that's the thing. They don't know where she was. Like, was she at home? Was she on her way to where the party was? Was she somewhere else? So they are just kind of calling to all of the hospitals in the area to see if she came in to have the baby. But that turned up nothing. So eventually, a group of them went to Akia's house. And that's when they realize that something insane has happened. Not only is Ikea not home, but neither is her stuff. All of her personal possessions are gone. All of her daughter's stuff is gone too. At this point, friends and family really don't know what to think. Do we know where Emery is? 
Yeah, so Emery wasn't with her okay. at, that, at the time. So Emery, I don't know where she was, but Emery is wherever she was supposed to be that day, whether it was with her father or with Akia's aunt or, or something like that. Okay. Yeah. And, and where's the roommate with her small child? Well, yeah, so I don't know if the roommate was home at that point, um, but the roommate does either she was home at that point or she came back, you know, soon after because they do talk to her. Yeah, so, but they're all kind of over at this house, like incredibly confused because it's not like she just packed a few bags and left. Like large items are missing, like a crib is gone. And again, Akia could barely walk at this point. So she wasn't moving a crib on her own. And, you know, everybody's standing there, like all of her family and friends who are invited to this baby shower, presumably, you know, the same people who she would ask for help if she needed to move. They're all standing look, there looking at each other going like, I didn't help her. Did you? Did you know about this? And nobody did. Plus, she didn't even own a car. So like, how would she have moved any of this stuff? So, unsurprisingly, this is when they call the police. Yeah. I mean, like, this this is screaming something, I mean, something bigger than just an abduction. Yeah, well, you would think. But uh, the Baltimore PD was not extremely interested. Because she was an adult. I mean, I guess... Because according to C.C. Diaz, that friend, they waited at the apartment for hours and no one showed up. Hmm. So they went down to the police station, but they still didn't have much luck. C.C. told reporter Claudia Rivero that police said, quote, maybe she's depressed. Maybe she just ran away. End quote. Yes. A bedridden 8.5 month pregnant woman with no car and a Big planned party, you know, though that always happens. It's that old story of you plan a big party, you put down a $900 deposit, you don't own a car, you're on bed rest, and you pick that time to just start a new life. We've all heard that one. But like what I don't understand, I mean, again, she's clearly in a medically fragile yeah, that- situation. And typically... That's what does get police to actually pay attention. Right. Yeah. That I mean, you know, sarcasm aside, she's medically endangered. Yeah. Like that should elevate her to critical missing because of her health concerns. So when the police are like, maybe she ran away. I mean, Cece is like, okay, well, this is extremely stupid. And, uh, you know, she went on to tell that reporter, quote, we know her condition and that girl could barely walk, end quote. But the point is, despite Akia's fragile medical condition, BPD did not initially take this case seriously. And unfortunately, I don't know how much time was lost with all of this nonsense, but eventually they finally did get on the case for real. So at some point, and again, I've never been able to find like a solid timeline of when the investigation actually started. Mm-hmm. But when it did, they, you know, did their own search of the apartments and started interviewing people. And of course, one of the first people that they talked to was the roommate. I would hope so. Right. And so they were like, hey, what's up with all this like emptiness? What's going on? And the roommate said, oh, yeah, she was moving out. According to detectives, the roommate showed them several text messages between her and Akia that talked about how Akia was going to move out and live with her baby's father. She was supposed to be gone by May 10th. And do we know when these this text message exchange occurred? No, that has not been public. And what's really frustrating is that they haven't made anything else about this public, meaning like we don't know if the baby's father ever came over to the apartment, mm-hmm. you know, like if the roommate had met him before. We don't know if he ever helped Akia move, you know, some of those belongings out or if the roommate was even home when any of that happened, if she even saw any of the stuff being moved. Like, we just don't know. I mean, for all we know, she just came home one day and all of Akia's things were gone. Like, no idea. Yeah. I'd be curious as to when the those text messages 
Yeah, like if they started on May 3rd. On the 3rd, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I don't know. I mean, again, I'm assuming the police know the answers to all of this. I'm hoping, but I just, I don't know. Once they start investigating this as an actual missing persons case, the police start to put together a timeline. Akia stopped posting on her Facebook page on April 28th. Her grandmother said she was texting with her on May 3rd, but again, she's not convinced that was actually her. But police eventually find proof that Akia was alive and well on May 3rd. So they find the friend who says that Akia asked her to give her a ride on May 3rd. This person took Akia to a Royal Farms, which is a gas station, to use an ATM and a BB&T bank to cash a cashier's check. Akia also allegedly went to other banks to pick up different checks. All that has been said of these checks is that they were coming from different people in different places. Don't know anything more. I just know that the BB&T one was for, I believe, $572. So she's collecting relatively large sums of money. Right. Cashing shit in to, to what? Well, I to mean... To what end? Are, are, we, are we thinking that this, that this is real? That she could have, like, picked up? Well, they don't... Yeah, at this point, they don't know what to think. And it does kind of fit with, like, okay, if you're planning on moving, maybe you're kind of gathering money together for that. Sure. You know, for rent, for security deposit, you know, for whatever. Yeah. They don't know what to think. But they do find out that the friend drove a Kia home around 2 or 3 that afternoon. And that is the last time anybody says that they saw her. Police were able to corroborate this story via security footage from that BB&T branch. In it, Akia is seen with a bright green top and yoga pants. Like, she's not acting under duress or concerned or, you know, anything. It's Mm -hmm. just a completely normal trip to the bank. But this footage is the last known sighting of Akia Eggleston. Police also tried to pull surveillance footage from her apartment, but surprise, surprise, the camera was broken. Oh, I mean, it is Baltimore. Yeah. They also pulled MTA footage to see if she had gotten on any buses, um, but the bank footage is the only footage that they were ever able to find. Now, obviously, the the next person police want to talk to is the father of Akia's child. Yeah. Yeah. Problem was, no one knew who he was. Mm. So I don't actually know how long it took them to get that information, I do hope it was soon, though, because according to Cece Diaz, that friend I mentioned earlier, she was the only one who knew his identity. And it sounds like she was among the people who originally went to police. So I'm like hoping that was one of the first things that she told them. One would hope. Right. Now, police have never publicly named this man, nor have they publicly named him as a suspect or even a person of interest. But... Cece has named him, and so is Akia's dad, Sean. According to Cece, this man is her cousin, Andre Michael Robinson. But I'm not sure if he and Akia met through Cece, because in addition to being Cece's cousin, he was Sean's, Akia's stepfather's, childhood friend. Oh, okay. So older. So he old. Yeah. Okay. Red flag number one. Yeah. Red flag number two. Dude never came forward to be like, oh my God, this woman who I'm having a baby with is missing. What can I do to help? Hmm. Now, one of our most common refrains on the show is that you don't know how you're going to act in a situation like this, but like you have to at least acknowledge the situation. Like this isn't okay. I mean, that's your baby out there somewhere. Yeah. There are a lot more red flags. I'm going to stop numbering them because, you know, my major was made up by JMU, (laughs) so I can't count that high. But here's some more info on this guy. He had other children with at least one other woman. I've read conflicting accounts as to whether or not they were together at this time. Hmm. But either way, this lady and Akia knew each other and uh, they were not fans. 
According to Cece, this woman had been sending Akia harassing text messages prior to her disappearance. In addition, Robinson never reached out to his old friend Sean or helped with any of the searches. So uh, uh, did the police question her? Yes, eventually. Okay. At some point. I don't, again, I don't know exactly when, but yes, both of them have been questioned by police. Now, anytime Sean is interviewed, uh, he, of course, is asked if he's reached out to Robinson, but he says that police have advised him not to. So to this day, four years after Akia's disappearance, I'm not sure that the two have spoken because Robinson certainly didn't reach out to Sean. Yeah, and the reason why the police would say that is because they would basically want to catch him in a lie. Right. And they wouldn't want her father giving him information that is privy to the case that, you know, the general public wouldn't know about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's clearly they don't want the, they don't want Sean to accidentally compromise the investigation. And I get that. I think he gets that too, you know? Yeah. So like I said, police did question Andre and his current slash ex-girlfriend, but while they weren't officially cleared, neither were they named as suspects. I mean, that's bizarre to me. They're the only ones that have motive. Right. Like, a lot of motive, it would seem. Yeah. You know? But then six months after her disappearance, something else strange happened. In October of 2017, family and friends held a vigil for Akia and her baby outside of her apartment. Afterwards, as they were cleaning up, they found something in the bushes. Akia's bank card. Now, this is six months later. Like, family has looked around. Police have done searches. But no one has ever seen this bank card. And it's described in the article I read as having been in the bushes. But, like, these people were cleaning up after a prayer vigil, you know? So I don't think they were going that hard in the bushes. Like, I don't think they were digging around. You know what I mean? Right. And Akia's stepfather, Sean, also said that it didn't look like it had been outside for six months. So they don't think it had been out there the entire time, which then begs the question, like, was it planted? And if so, why? Yeah, I I mean, I would think that it would be somebody trying to get rid of evidence, but why would you do it at... At her apartment. At her, yes, at, at, at her vigil. Yeah. At her apartment. Like, that seems absurd to me. I know. It's just such... I just don't understand either how it could have been missed for six months or why somebody would have planted it. Like, nothing makes sense about it. So did they turn it over to the police? Yes, yes, they did. Was it fingerprinted? Yeah, I, I assume so. Police haven't specifically said that. But yes, police do have it and just wouldn't say anything more about it, basically. Did they get a list of people that were at the block party? I mean, you know, I I know none of this is going to be put out there, but that's just where my head is. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. The last time Akia's cell phone pinged was in the Inner Harbor area near one of the banks that she visited. Police believe she was actively moving on May 3rd, meaning like they think that at least some of those belongings were removed on that day. So it really does seem like she thought she was getting ready to start her new life with the father of her child. We know who this man is. Akia's friend says that the man's girlfriend or ex-girlfriend had been harassing Akia. Police have spoken to both of them. But over four years have passed, and police don't seem to be any closer to solving her case today than they were when they first reported her missing. So this is what really struck me once people started talking about, like, Gabby's case this past week and, you know, why is she getting so much attention? I'm thinking about the weird circumstances around it, but this is really weird, too, you know? And the thing with Gabby's case as well... What is, which is similar here, is that, you know, she was with her fiancé. The fiancé kind of came back alone, didn't report her missing, didn't search for her, nothing. And in Akia's case, 
we know we don't know for sure that she was with Andre Michael Robinson when she went missing, but she went missing. He didn't report her missing. He didn't help search for her. Nothing. You know, you have these two very clear suspects in these cases. And in Akia Eggleston's case, it's been four years and nothing. There's so much to this. I, 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 even beyond Andre, like in my mind, the roommate is still, would still be a person of interest too. You know, so police I, I mean, have said that she's not. Like police have come out and said that she's not. That wait, they are, she's they said the provided, same thing about Andre. Well, no, no, no. They didn't say that he was not a person of interest. They just didn't say that he was. So the two people in this that police have said that they've like talked to and have basically like cleared, although they didn't say the word cleared, were the roommate and the friend who uh, gave Akia the ride. It just seems like there's a lot that they're missing. I mean, there has to be, right? Like, yeah. how does an eight and a half month pregnant woman with a bunch of cash, like just disappear. Yeah. I mean, and especially in Baltimore. Yeah. Like it's not like there's a whole lot of places to hide bodies in Baltimore. Most bodies are found in Baltimore, you know? Well, yeah, but, and so they have done searches over the years of, you know, what they've called wooded areas. Yeah. But Um, what about, what about Andre's house, his apartment, wherever? I have no idea. The, 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 his girlfriend, maybe ex-girlfriend, whatever. Like, yeah. Why was she pulling out all this cash? Right. You know, there's, there's so there's so much that's that's not that's unanswered. It and, is, and, and, I, and don't... I get it. It's Baltimore's practice to not reveal anything, which is in, insanely infuriating. Mm-hmm. Balt- Baltimore PD just has a general mistrust of the media, and they don't yeah. they don't release any information on anything. We've talked about this in missing persons cases, like. I understand you have to keep some information close to the vest, but like you can't keep everybody in the dark. Well, right. And, and that's Sean's biggest complaint. He has expressed his displeasure with the Baltimore police department, lamenting that they didn't take a Kia's case seriously at first and wasted valuable time. He's also complained about their lack of communication. Yeah. I mean, they might be doing a fucking bang up job on the investigation at this point, but, you know, if you if you don't communicate certain things, especially to the family members, like y- you lose them. Right. And yeah. He was on The View one time and he was like, I have to jump through hoops just to get anyone there to talk to me. Yeah. And and a missing person is not the same as a homicide investigation. Mm-hmm. And I understand that they're, they're probably thinking, especially now it's four years later. Yeah. That, you know, it, it's probably going to turn into a homicide investigation. However, it's not right now, and perhaps sharing inf- some information would have helped earlier in the in the investigation in finding her. Right. It isn't, though, just the lack of communication from BPD. Sean also says that Akia lived in a very tight-lipped area of Baltimore, and people around there didn't take kindly to strangers coming around and asking questions. But, you know, it's been four years. A woman and her child are missing. And another child is growing up without the mother she loved. You know, somebody out there knows something. And if they haven't come forward yet, like, you got you to gotta come forward. You know, strangers asking questions or not. Right. It's so frustrating because... In the past four years, like, yes, I was able to find news stories on this, but nothing from the beginning of her case, you know, this was not a case that was covered when it was actually happening. All of the stories that you see are like, it's a year later and Akia Eggleston is still missing. Now on the second anniversary, Akia Eggleston's father says, not only did BPD not take this seriously, neither did the media at first. And it's mind-blowing to me. Again, eight and a half months pregnant, gone under very shady 
circumstances with a very clear suspect. And it's just, it was crickets. So yes, missing white woman syndrome is real. It absolutely is. And sometimes people like Akia Eggleston fall through the cracks because of it. But she doesn't deserve to fall through the cracks. Her baby doesn't deserve to fall through the cracks, certainly. So we just need to continue, even though we're four years too late, we need to continue to amplify her story and, you know, make sure that people know her name. I'm going to leave you this week with a post that Sean made in the Missing Akia Eggleston Facebook group. He posted this just a few weeks ago on September 6th, which was her 27th birthday. He signed it like he does all of his posts as a grieving father. Quote, Good morning. The rain has ended and the sun is shining on today. I wanted to say happy birthday, sweetheart. You are truly missed, and I and the family are still keeping you and the baby boy in our deepest prayers. We are still fighting for your return every chance possible. There are no words to describe these days since you have been gone. I try to laugh with your daughter as she is growing up without you. I cry deep inside because I do not know where you are and if you're okay. Will no one speak on your behalf? What happened to you? Will anyone step forward from the community? Is there a friend who knows more than they are saying? Did you confide in someone who knows the truth? What is the one thing the police are missing that can bring you home? Have the police absolutely spoken to everyone they could have? Have they really put the vice down on those who have information? Please, God, release us from this bondage. It hurts way too deep. Loss is part of life, but the not knowing is what keeps the fight alive. Again, wishing you a happy birthday, baby girl. Hope to see you soon. A grieving father. End quote. That's crushing. Yeah. Kia Shanta Eggleston has been missing since May 3rd, 2017. She was between 4 foot 8 and 4 foot 11 and was wearing a green t-shirt and black yoga pants at the time of her disappearance. Akia has a tattoo of two cherries on her left shoulder and a tattoo of the name Emery on her right bicep. She was eight months pregnant. Akia was 22 years old when she disappeared. She would be 27 today. Her baby would be four. There's a $25,000 reward for information about her case. So if you do have any information on Akia's disappearance, please contact Maryland Crime Stoppers at 1-866-7-LOCKUP. You can also contact the FBI's Baltimore Field Office at 410-265-8080 or the Baltimore City Police Department at 410-396-396. 2499. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production.